Welcome back to the Cage Rage Podcast. This is Devin. I am joined by Miguel Iterati, and we are going to recap last night's UFC on ESPN Plus 16 card that was headlined by a very pivotal lightweight um, contender fight between Justin Gaethje and Donald Cowboy Cerrone. And here's the headline from ESPN. Gaethje stops Cerrone in the first calls for a title shot. So, Miguel, this is two losses in a row now for Donald Cerrone. Cerrone um, got had to stop after the second round of his fight with Donald, with Tony Ferguson over the summer. Comes in this bout and gets and gets leveled in the first round by Justin Gaethje, who's now on a three fight win streak. All three in the first round, first round knockouts. Um, I thought this was interesting that he went straight for calling for a title fight after this big win declaring himself a number one contender after Tony Ferguson and did call out Conor McGregor. This is two fights now in a row, namely Nate Diaz and now Justin Gaethje, where you kind of expected if they would win this fight, that they're going to probably call out Justin uh, Conor McGregor and they've skipped right over Conor. So apparently Conor's not um, much on the radar of these guys anymore. And Justin Gaethje wants a title fight, which he's probably not going to get next. But what are your thoughts on this, uh, Miguel? Yeah, I think, you know, the omission of Connor, you know, that those are the times we're in now. You know, he, he's let a lot of time go by, you know. The Mayweather thing is the Mayweather thing, but it's now several years old, you know. Uh, he came back to the UFC after that. There was, you know, a lot of controversy around it. But at the end of the day, that paycheck wasn't the same, you know. And there's motivational factors and things. And now I think his paychecks are going to continue to come back to the pack. You know what I mean? If you made 30 last time, 20 this time. You know, can you turn down twenty million? I don't know how that goes. So, Connor's the odd man out here, and I think that the rest of the guys kind of like putting him in that position. You know what I mean? Um, I, I don't think the UFC minds putting him in that position either. So, yeah, there may be some orchestration to this. Gaethje also said he, he'd offer Cerrone a, a rematch too, and I, I don't think that's a good idea. No, I don't either. And I do think it's somewhat disingenuous. I mean, I'm not necessarily a Connor McGregor fanboy or anything. And I know that you're not, and I don't think really anybody here on the CRP is. But we do see in, indications like stuff like with Don, with like Dustin Poirier. He he before the fight with Khabib wouldn't even entertain the idea of rematching Connor if he were to beat Khabib. As soon as he loses to Khabib, he wants to rematch with Connor. And Connor's just coming out, you know, makes a tweet like maybe if you would have basically saying if you would have put more respect on my name, we might have been able to do it. But you know, I flattened you in 90 seconds. Don't be calling me out now when you acted like I was irrelevant before that. Justin Gaethje, I do believe he's the second, he's the number two contender in line for Khabib right now after Tony Ferguson. I do agree with that. Um, but it, let's make no mistake about it. I think you'll agree with me. If he's if the UFC ends up offering the red panty night with Conor McGregor and Conor McGregor's into it, Justin Gaethje's going to be quick to sign on the dotted line. Yeah, if not, I mean, he's going to have to wait. They're going to have to do Ferguson and – uh, Khabib, I don't think, you know, uh, they they have any way of looking good without doing that fight at this point. So they, they, they're they kind of boxed into a corner again. Of course, you know, if Ferguson gets injured, then they'll, they'll write it off as fast as possible, right? But um, they're trapped into that fight. And, and Dane has also sta stated, you know, that McGregor is kind of waiting in the wings for Khabib if Ferguson, if it doesn't go through, you know what I mean? So Gagey might be number three behind it, you know, uh, it might be number three in line. And, uh, you know, that sounds about right. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Connor, everyone's sort of waiting to see what happens with Connor next. You know, um, it's going to be interesting, you know, if he takes a fight and loses again, then, you know, where is his pecking? Are he going to be in this pecking order, which is a pretty severe, you know, there's a lot of tough guys there, right? So uh that's kind of what everybody's waiting for you know he's gonna either cement himself in the top five with his next fight or fall out of it mm -hmm. I, I do want to talk a little bit about just justin gaethje as, as a whole as just who he is right now because there was a lot of criticism about justin gaethje when he first came into the sport that there's no way that this style can hold up for longevity that he takes too much damage he plots forward he takes shots to give a shot we haven't really seen that in his last three fights, and he's fought some pretty dangerous guys. James Vick was a very tall, lanky striker who was on a good run. I think he was like 7-1 and one in the UFC when he fought Justin Gaethje the first time. His next fight after that was Edson Barbosa, and we know how dangerous of a striker he is, and he got him out in the first round just like he did Vick. And now he's going in there against Donald Cerrone, 
and flattens him in one round. And he's not really also taking too much damage in these fights, and he's getting them out of there quick. He's really relying on his boxing-heavy power. But you compare that to his debut fight in the UFC with Michael Johnson after being an undefeated World Series of Fighting champion, his fight with Eddie Alvarez, and then his fight with Dustin Poirier. Those were such wars that he took so much damage in each of those fights that I remember people saying, like, this this man's going to have serious CTE. He's going to have to change up his style if he wants to move forward. He's clearly very talented. He's got a wrestling background. He can box. He's got good leg kicks. But he's just taking too much damage. I think from indications of what we've seen in these past three fights, which we don't know much, I mean, I'm guessing the combined time frame of them is just a little over one round. I mean, he, they, he's been getting guys out of there in three minutes or less, really. Um uh, he seems to be have really, really found his groove, and he's 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 a little bit de- defensively better, and he's rolling with punches better, and he's landing those punches um, cleaner and rocking guys. So if he's really shaping, shored up some of his defensive holes, and and stops taking so much damage, Justin Gage could be a real threat for anybody in this division. Yeah, he uses a lot. He uses motion real well, you know, to, and that's I think that's been the big ad for him is that he's using that in his defense and not getting tagged as much. Uh, that's been a big plus for him, right? Uh, he's quick still, you know. He was quicker in Cerrone yesterday, and uh, you know it showed. I, I think you know I don't want to talk bad about Cerrone, but I I don't like anything I saw in Cerrone yesterday when he got frozen on one knee and kind of like you know. Uh, Goku pose or one of those like you know manga poses that people you know that are that are hot nowadays and stuff you know that's not a good neurological sign your body's not reacting your body's not doing what you know you you want your body to do when you're stuck in that position and again the whole his forehead was on the ground you, you know he's playing defense this way and and Gagey's like you know asking the ref and you know you're gonna let me keep hitting him and stuff and then he gets up with a little bit of an attitude, like he's fine. No, no, no. There's, there's <laughs> something that I didn't like that whole sequence. I didn't think it showed anything good. And uh, I think it's showing maybe that Cerrone, after all the wars, maybe misreading a little bit about himself, his body reacts and stuff, because that that's those are not good signs right there. No, and I thought also for the first time in Donald's um, career, he was just cringy. Uh, on the pre- on the microphone afterwards, like him getting up there and hugging all over Gaethje, and you know that that just it it seemed it just seemed like I said cringy, and I've never really seen that with Donald Cerrone. But we you know we we've thrown in the towel kind of on Donald Cerrone in the past though. We've kind of had a view that his best days were behind him, and so did the UFC. They started to really pivot him to be a gatekeeper. They threw him in there with Mike Perry at Wel- welterweight. He got him out of there. He They threw him in there with Alexander Hernandez at lightweight. He beat him. Then he had his great, what I thought was his best performance on his little career resurg- resurgent run earlier this year against Ally Aquino. looked great in a fight that I didn't think he was going to win. Um, but since then, he's been put in there with two of the top of the elite, elite of the elite and in Tony Ferguson and Justin Gaethje, and he's been kind of knocked back down to size. I'm not ready to throw in the towel on Donald. I think he can extend his record with for the winningest fighter in UFC history. I think he still has some wins in him. I think he still has some fight in him. He definitely does not want to throw in the towel yet, so I think that's a little bit premature. But um, the neurological exam wouldn't hurt anybody right around that. Yeah, I agree with that because he's um, – but he's, he's just a born fighter, and – um, but I do think that it was – we got a little bit hopeful about um, how far he can go with his career resurgence at this division right now with where he's at. But um, speaking of a little bit, we talked a little bit about Gaethje really reforming his style and it's paying off. We saw on the co-main event another um, revamp of uh, – another guy that we've been talking about has really revamped his style the older he's gotten. That's Glover Teixeira, man. Glover Teixeira has definitely become more of – a grapple heavy fighter and it's paying off for him. This was a very close fight. Nikita Krylov's really improved in his grappling. Um, they, this went back and forth on the ground, not much striking for two guys who are pro- predominantly known for their striking, but I did edge this out a little bit for Glover. It was very, very close. It could have gone either way, but um, Glover back in the win column now. And when I look at Glover in his resume right now, I believe he's on a three fight win streak and he's won um, four of his last five, I believe. I'm going to pull that up real quick, but I know that he, um, yeah, he's won four of his last five on a three fight win streak. Um, this probably puts him back into the top 10 at light heavyweight. And I mean, he's an old vet with a lot of experience, good grappling, heavy hands. 
Um, good win for Glover. Yeah, I think people should take a look at and study it a little bit because, you know, you can come up and be rugged all you want. And, that, you know, I'll always remember Glover Teixeira as the guy. They couldn't even match. They couldn't find guys to fight him, remember? So, you know, and now he's fighting a much more cerebral style, and it involves, you know, self-preservation too, which, you know, you want to see fighters incorporating that, It's especially at some point when age is beginning to, you know, take its toll as well. Uh, you want to see them start to fight smarter, and that's what you're seeing here. Yeah, coming into this fight, they had Glover ranked at number nine and Krylov ranked as number 13. So they're still kind of looking at Glover as a late 30-year-old with some name value that they can use, a younger contender that's coming up the ranks as, probably, as a potential propellant to get into the top 10, and he's shutting that down. I think moving forward, I think um, you know fights with somebody like Volkan Uzdemir could be a good fight. Um, there's some other young contenders that they might try to sacrifice them to, like Alexander Raykick and Johnny Walker and Dominic Reyes and them. But um, right now he's on a good run. Um, I don't know how far it's going to take him, but I do expect him to probably fight a top 10 guy or at least one of these really top young contenders next going forward. So good win for him to get back in the win column. We've been talking about that here on the CRP for his last several fights. But moving on from here, um, this fight ended very disappointingly. Todd Duffy returned after, I believe, four years, takes on Jeff Hughes, a uh, Dana White contender series standout. And um, it looked to me, I, I'm not the type that ever wants to uh, degrade or, you know, put, put assumptions on something that I've seen that, you know, I might look one way, but we don't really know what was going in that guy's mind at the time. It looked to me like Duffy wanted out of this fight. And I, I don't know how you saw this. What what'd you think, uh, Miguel? Yeah, I, I, I wasn't overly impressed. And, you know, uh, the eye poke seems to happen more in the heavyweight fights. And, you know, you're kind of – it's just I, – I don't know. It's just – it's one of those things where there's very little high-end talent in the high heavyweight division, you know. So a guy like Ty Duffy who uh, one day – once upon a time had a little bit of a, a gloss around his name. He comes back now and he's got, you know, a main card spot. And, uh, you know, I don't know that that, that was deserved, uh, you know, to, for, for, from what we have there. But he's a big guy, so that's what what it's about. But overall, just not, not impressed. No, neither was I. I was actually kind of impressed with Jeff Hughes, though. I mean, he, he doesn't look like he's in the best of shape, but, but he was scrappy. He was staying very composed and tight. Um, as I was watching this with Duffy just teeing off on him against the cage and getting countered every now and then, I was like watching that thinking, I'm like, Jeff Hughes is going to end up laying Todd Duffy out. T Todd Duffy looked like he was starting to fatigue a little bit, and then he gets the po poke in the eye, and he just he didn't really seem too enthusiastically protesting them stopping this fight. He seemed like he was really um, content content with the fight ending. So that – Disappointing for both both fighters, but I don't see the UFC rushing to do much with Todd Duffy moving forward. Going on to here, this, the hero of the night, the Rocky Balboa of the night, was a last-minute replacement for a very hyped M Michelle Pereira. Michelle Pereira coming in um, with a lot of hype behind him and was literally – I mean, there, I saw an, an article on CNN. I really wish I should have got the screenshot for this where it was like we literally had a fighter in the UFC doing like flips in the octagon last night. This man did a backflip, was flipping off the cage, was so seemed so confident, so arrogant early on in the fight. Um, and then here you have this hometown boy who took this fight on the, on last second notice, notice clearly outweighed, um, clearly outskilled in a lot of ways. You saw a difference in just athleticism and really martial arts skill early on with Michelle Pereira versus him. But yet this guy, this kid, Tristan Connolly, stayed composed, kept his hands high, stayed moving forward, wore um, Pereira out, and grinded out a decision. And um, this was um, – I like this headline that I saw on, from CBS, Tristan Connolly upsets Humble's stylish Michael, Michelle Pereira. I think that describes the fight because this really was kind of a humbling – and it was also a very good night for Vancouver's own to go in there on, in his UFC debut under Wade – on short notice against a very hyped prospect and get the win. So this was this was a cool Rocky Balboa story here, and I just I already saw Ariel Hawani's lineup for tomorrow. He will be on with Ariel Hawani, so great for this kid. Yeah, and that was exciting. I, and everybody probably has seen the Pereira highlight. You know, it's funny when you're the, the loser and the opponent is, is the guy getting all the hype and stuff, and that's, that's a lot of what that was about, you know. Uh, I think the 
note around one of the clips I saw was like, how do you defend against it? You know, mm -hmm. just put your hard hat on and do the hard work. And that's what the kid did. And, and he, he got the W. So uh, more power to him. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. He just, he just, he trudged forward and um, was willing to take the shots and to give the shots and um, put in a great performance. Moving on from here, we saw uh, a guy who once was hailed by Dana White on the Ultimate Fighter series as the, as the next Anderson Silva, Uriah Hall, who uh, infamously got one of the coolest spinning back kick knockouts in uh, Ultimate Fighter history, UFC history, really. Had a great striker, but really has just kind of, I mean, if you got if you got to put him into the boom or bust out of all the top, these really heavily um, promoted prospects, he falls in the bust category. But he's been steadily in the top 15 of the rankings, and he's a good fighter. And he took on a guy who stylistically was kind of a nightmare for him, and Antonio Carlos Jr., somebody with really good ground game, doesn't try to pretend to be a striker, tries to take the fight to the ground. And um, this was a really close fight. Uriah Hall almost gave it away a couple times in some grappling scenarios. But nevertheless, he bloodied him up, um, really put in more damage. And I'm, I'm glad the judges saw it this way because I, I think – Five ten years ago, when MMA judging was so heavily about the grappling, this probably would have gone the other way. But they went with damage in this fight, and Uriah Hall picks up a win. And um, this is two wins in a row for him now. I mean, his last four losses, he's he's still three and four in his last seven. So he still has a losing record in his last seven fights. But those losses were to Robert Whitaker, Derek Brunson, Musasi, and Paulo Costa. So he's losing to really good guys. So I think that that's something to take into consideration. And he also beat Costa. I mean, beat uh, Musasi um, in the UFC earlier on. So um, he's been in there with some good guys, and he's definitely going to keep his ranking from here on. Um, I'm looking at that right now. Coming into this fight, he was ranked um, number 12, and Carlos Jr. was ranked number 13. So there won't be any change there, and I think that those will stay about where they're at. I don't think Uriah Hall really elevated himself up to, like, uh, is going to push himself up in the rankings with this, but he, he's going to keep his number, but next to his name after this. Yeah. I mean, that's what you want when you're Uriah Hall at this point. You, like you said, you're kind of a boss, not a boss, you know, in, in your, the way you think of it, but you know, you're not going to be a champion at this point uh, unless something miraculous happens. And uh, you know, uh, you, you work to stay on the roster at this point, you work to keep the paydays and stuff like that. And that's what, you know, you always got to keep winning and, that's what he achieved. So not bad, you know, more power to him. He's going to, you know, at the end of the day, he's going to be one of those guys with 30, you know, UFC fights because he's going to be able to stay on the roster and, and keep keep a job. And at the end of the day, that, that, there's nothing wrong with that, really. No, and and he's he put in some exciting performances with some cool knockouts. So good win for him. Um, speaking of another guy who's kind of in that same category of just kind of busts who are not going to become a champion or anything, but – Misha Serkinov does hand a young 23-year-old, 20, I believe, undefeated Jimmy Crute his first defeat with a uh, rare Peruvian necktie submission. This is a cool win for um, Serkinov. Jimmy Crute had a lot of hype behind him. They're definitely, obviously, looking at Serkinov as a potential um, gatekeeper for a young, <laughs> early 20s undefeated guy that they threw him in there with. Serkinov came into this fight still ranked number 15, so he still has a number next to his name in light heavyweight which to me just shows how thin those divisions are. But he also came out right after this in the post-conference and said he, and he's literally begging to the fans, please don't give up on me before I get to UFC's top five. So he's uh, he's looking at the UFC and he's looking at the UFC's fans' percep perception after tough knockouts to Vulcan Uzdemir and Johnny Walker that, you know, he's, he's not going to be a real contender or nothing. And he's saying, please don't give up on me. I've always thought Misha Serkinov was a real talented kid, um, just really chinny. Like he gets in there with these good with these good strikers, and he just he gets hit and folds. And um, you know, I don't know if it's just been he's just taking really hard shots, or if he just really is just kind of a folder in big matchups against heavy strikers. But this is a good win for him. Yeah, and, and he faced a little bit of adversity. I mean, it looked like he was getting hit, so you know. Um... More power to him for the again this win, and you know it keeps him on the roster and stuff like that. Again, you know if he, yeah, we'll see how close to the top five he gets. He's a few wins away. Yeah, I, I agree, and he he's definitely going to have to beat some beat a legit ranked contender to move up, I believe, in the rankings. 
Final fight of the night that I want to cover. Um, Augusto Sakai needs less than one minute to flatten Marcin Tibera. And Augusto Sakai is a guy I've seen before and was really impressed with. He's only um, he's now 14-1-1 in his uh, MMA tenure, 28 years old. He's now 3-0 and in the UFC after coming off a big win in the Contender Series. And he's got wins over Chase Sherman by ground and pound in the third, a, a split decision win over Andre Arlovsky, and now gets a one-round um, knockout in less than a minute over Marcin Tibera. Um, I think that he could be an interesting uh, addition to a very thin and stale heavyweight division that hasn't really had too much new talent in in the past several years. I always get excited whenever I see some guy who's young, he's he's under 30, he's undefeated in the UFC, he's getting cool knockouts, he's got a really good record. Uh, you know, I get excited because it's like, man, can we please get some new new faces at these higher divisions? And I think Augusto Sakai is somebody that I've seen that does kind of fit the bill as somebody that uh, um, has some potential to be a legit um, ranked ranked contender at heavyweight. So um, he's now 3-0 in the UFC. If you count the contender series, 5-4-0 in the UFC. And he gets his best performance to date with this. Yeah, you know, there's not much you can read from a one-minute fight. It all went his way, and that's good. You know, you, you want to add those up on your resume as much as possible. So he's doing the right things, but you know, like I said, you know, once you get once you get up into the upper level of these guys, you know, there there have been uh, you know levels. There's been cavernous you know differences between the guys, and uh, you know we'll see how Sakai adjusts to the next level. Yeah, and they got I mean plenty of people that I believe that he could fight and win against. Some people like Alexi Olenek and Ty Tuivasa, Walt Harris, Shamil. Uh, I'm not even gonna try his last name, but Lagoy Ivanov, some of these guys, and then there's other people in the in the division that are just you know they're veterans who have some name value. That you know if he gets a couple more wins, he can get in there against people like Overeem and Dos Santos and Derek Lewis and these guys. So, um, but it just I, I would like to see. I'm rooting for you, Augusto, because we need some new faces at heavyweight to talk about instead of the same old recycled ones. And so having such an elitist, we saw that just last week with Curtis Blades fighting Shamil uh, Abdurakimov. Just the elite of the elite of this division are just so much better. And Curtis Blades has been in there twice with Ngannou and got knocked out. So there's even an elite of the elite at the top of heavyweight. So um, just the top guys are so far ahead of the rest of them. And, you know, I want to see somebody, a new face come up that's uh, – get you excited about potential fights in the future. But any last words, Miguel, any other thoughts on this card? No, overall, like I said, uh, just a brief call for maybe more uh, neurological exams and testing and stuff. I don't like Cerrone's body language and reaction and stuff like that. And I think, you know, when you're talking about a warrior, you don't want to criticize and I'm not criticizing. I, I'm, I'm standing up for, for his own safety. And that is, you know, maybe maybe somebody should say, you know, what, what's one more medical exam, Don? You know, let's go check and see, and you know, how deteriorated is your neurological responses from where it was a few fights ago and things. Um, just so you know, may, maybe I'm way off, but just his overcompensation in the, like you said, the cringe factor in the interviews and stuff. Just there's something not the same there, and uh, I didn't like it. So uh, that would be my final word on what was overall. Other than that, a good show and a good showing for Gaethje. All right. We'll get back here on Wednesday. We'll cover up. We'll do a news roundup. We'll cover up whatever uh, news matchups get dropped over the weekend, whatever big news comes out. And we'll also give a preview to uh, next weekend's bout with uh, Yaya Rodriguez and Jeremy Stevens. But until then, signing off for the CRP, this is Devin. Good talking with you, Miguel, and I'll see you later on this week. Great. Thanks, Dev. Talk to you later. Talk to you later.